introduce Michael Cohan, who goes by Mike. Uh, he's a nice. What's wrong? Good, good to go. Okay. All these stops and starts for all, for, are for all of you on Zoom. Thanks for being there. So Mike is a 1986 graduate of the Citadel where he obtained a BS degree in business administration. Um, later, he obtained his law degree at Cumberland School of Law here at Samford in 1993. He's practiced throughout the states of Alabama and Georgia. Uh, he is a graduate of Leadership Montgomery and is a veteran, having served 11 years in the United States Army Reserves and the JAG Corps. Mike lives in Auburn with his wife and two children. This is Mike. <laughs> we also have F. Jackson Rogers, who goes by Jack, just Jack. <laughs> Just Jack. So Jack ob obtained his uh, undergraduate degree in 1992 uh, from Auburn University at Montgomery in business administration. He got his law degree from Jones School of Law, Faulkner University in 1998. After graduation, he served as a law clerk for Justice Mark, McK Mark Kennedy and for Justice John England on the Alabama Supreme Court. Jack is a graduate of Leadership Lowndes County. He is a member of St. Paul Episcopal Church in Lowndesboro, Alabama, and lives on the family farm in Lowndes County. He is the father of four children. Please welcome Mike and Jack. Thank y'all. Can y'all can y'all hear me? Is the mic on? Okay, good deal. Uh, as you can see from us sitting here, we're going to keep this sort of informal and bounce around. And if y'all have comments, questions, uh, please speak up. I know that y'all are on Zoom. Um, I think it's going to show up on the screen over here. Uh, if you have a question, and we'll try to interrupt and 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 do that. But let's we're going to keep it very very low key and informal uh, today. Uh, if somebody sees a question come up on the screen, just kind of give us a little nod so we'll yeah, know. Because we can't really see up there. Uh, you know, we got you back here. Uh, you've asked uh, two lawyers to speak on ethics. I think that's a joke in and of itself. Uh, you know, what's, <laughs> what's worse than one lawyer talking about ethics, two lawyers talking about ethics. Uh, but slide. Uh, what we're going to talk today about is ethics in workers' comp, obviously, but ethics not just from a um, adjuster standpoint, but everybody that's involved in workers' comp, and that's attorneys, uh, the judges, employers, uh, obviously adjusters, and, and the employees all have ethical considerations that we're going to kind of talk about today. Uh, some of the, uh, obviously, ethics uh, you know, tell your kids, or if, if you got kids or you were a kid, you've heard, you know, ethics is simply doing the right thing. Um, but I think you'll, as we go through today, it's not just as simple as just do the right thing. We're all governed by certain rules, statutes, laws, regulations uh, that, that dictate uh, our ethical obligations and our ethical behavior in a worker's comp case. And we're going to try to hit on, on some of that today. Uh, slide where we are. I can't see. There we go. Okay. We'll start with some uh, what we, what we're required to do, or what we're governed by from an ethical standpoint. Uh, we're governed generally by the the Alabama State Bar, uh, who license us and then regulate what we can and cannot do. Uh, and there's a whole big fat book of uh, ethical rules that govern what we can and cannot do. Um, I try to lay them out here at the different different issues that we have to deal with, and that's attorney client uh, relations between attorneys and attorneys, attorney claimants, and attorney judges. And it, you know, you see that when he's talking about attorney attorney, that's also the attorney that we've got on the other side of us. We have a duty to an ethical duty to that other attorney, 
and it may be things where it comes up a lot. You'll see it, you know, when you, um, those of you who handle claims, you'll see when we're talking about as attorneys responding to discovery and things of that nature, you know, there, there may be this big, big pile of documents that, that, you know, has either been presented to us by the employer or, by, or from the claims person. And we have, in some of those documents, maybe we would really not rather them, you know, we'd rather them not have but we have an ethical duty to produce those documents unless we can find an objection for that. So, uh, you know, that's, you'll see a lot of times in our discovery, those objections that we make, and that's because we're finding a way maybe not to produce those documents. But if we don't, you know, if, if there's not an objection we can make to it and we've got the documents, we have to give them for, give them to the other side. And that's because of the, the ethical uh, considerations that we have to, to, to go by. Slide. Uh, you know, everybody hears the attorney client, attorney client, attorney client. Uh, in in a workers' compensation situation, and, and in any insurance defense situation that we're involved in, it's kind of a unique situation in that we have a we, we have two folks that we answer to generally, and one is the insurance company, and then one is also uh, the actual employer in a workers' comp case. Uh, and it, it's sometimes that can be an issue, uh, but recognize that ultimately, uh, per the rules that govern us, our client is the employer. Uh, now, sometimes we all lose sight of that because in a workers' comp setting, oftentimes the employer is not involved uh, or is remotely involved in our, our dealings 99% of the time or simply with an adjuster or the insurance company or a third party uh, administrator. But ultimately, we have to answer to the employer who is the true client. Uh, and along those lines, it's, it's important to remember that because we have that duty with the employer, uh, there are certain things that, that we may be obligated to tell the employer uh, or, or, or keep sometimes keep from y'all um, some issues that may not be related to the, to the claim that the employer tells us. That's where the attorney-client privilege really exists. So it's, it's important to remember that although y'all are the ones that have hired us, y'all are the ones we're reporting to, and most importantly, y'all are the ones that are paying us, um, still our ultimate client is, is in fact the employer. Uh, also with an attorney-client privilege, you know, it, it it's not absolute. Um, there are always exceptions to every rule, and, and there is with the attorney-client privilege, privilege as well. Uh, I was using an example of, of in, in a criminal setting, uh, you know, the, a criminal can't come to us and, and, and expect absolution for everything that they're going to do. Uh, they may tell us what they have done, and there's a privilege there. But if they tell us, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get Jack tomorrow, and I'm going to take care of Jack tomorrow, uh, that's that's not necessarily covered. Um, so, like with any rule and every any anything, uh, there are exceptions to it. But the most important thing there, from a from a workers' comp standpoint, is to remember who we actually represent ultimately. Slide. Where are we at? Got it. Jack, you touched on this just oh, a minute ago. On which? Oh, with the uh, yeah, with the opposing counsel. Um, Again, with the, with the ethical considerations as far as the documents I discussed before. And also, you know, sometimes that lawyer on the other side is doing things to um, make you, the adjuster, very, very angry, make me, the uh, opposing counsel, very angry. And we, our, our first blush might be to pitch a fit with them, but, but we can't do that. Um, we, we could get in trouble with the bar. There's things that we can't say, certainly things, emails that we can't send. And so we, you know, that's something we have to consider all the time because of our relationship with the bar. And that attorney is also a member of the bar and that's a fight we don't want to fight. And so you, you just have to be careful with your, your relationships with that other attorney. And I, I put on there, be civil with opposing counsel. And I know that, you know, that sounds kind of funny, but that is actually, a, a, that's an ethical rule that we're obligated to, to, to follow. Um, and so sometimes when y'all, y'all may be frustrated and call us and go, you know, y'all go get him. Um, y'all tell him what's what. 
um, recognize that there are there are limitations to how far we can we can take that. Um, you know, it, I guess what what is civil amongst lawyers may be different than what it is in the general public, but but we do have to uh, we have to play by those rules. Um, next one is the attorney claimant uh, relationship, and this this really comes into play in a, in a situation where you've got a pro se or unrepresented uh, claimant. Uh, you know, we, we have to use extra caution uh, with those individuals. Uh, they're not lawyers, they're not adjusters, they're not trained in, in, in this world of workers' comp, they don't know what's going on. Uh, and, and obviously you can't use your knowledge or your upper hand to take advantage of a claimant in that situation. Mm -hmm. uh, the same rules of do apply, however, uh, to a claimant, whether they're represented or not in a, in a workers' compensation or any, any litigation setting. Uh, but again, you've got to, you've got to exercise caution. Uh, you know, judges, if it, if it gets in front of a judge, are going to go overboard to assist that unrepresented claimant, um, recognizing that. Um, and the, if they find that you have uh, taken advantage of them or uh, gone beyond the, the rules of, of decency, I guess, um, that's not going to bode well for you, but, and obviously, in, in, again, this is a pro se type situation. There wouldn't be the, the interaction with a claimant uh, if they were represented. Oftentimes, where I find the interaction with claimants come with uh, settlements um, that we may get walk through settlements where you all have already settled the claim with the claimant, and then we get it simply to get the case. Uh, approved by the judge or by the ombudsman, um, and and that's a situation that it, you know they're coming to us, and we're the first lawyer they're seeing uh, about this process. They've they only talked to y'all, um, most likely, and and it's it's a situation where we really have to be careful uh, with what we say to these claimants and how we handle these claimants because they're in a very very precarious situation, uh, seeing a lawyer for the first time. Who does not represent him, and oftentimes they don't even realize that. Um, they think they think sometimes we're their lawyer or we're just a neutral lawyer. Um, and, so, you know, I've seen the surprise on their face before when I've been talking, you know, and I've sent them. I, I generally like if I'm doing a walkthrough with them, I will send them a copy. I'll email as soon as I get get everything drafted up, and what I email to them is an affidavit that I'm going to ask them to sign, where they realize that I'm not their lawyer. You know that I've been hired to represent. XYZ company and its workers comp carrier. And they've seen the document, we will get to the hearing. And then they, when, then they're surprised when, when I'm not their lawyer. And then they want to ask you questions about, is this a good settlement? You know, and I mean, I don't know how many times that's happened. This happened a lot. Uh, should I take this? Should I do this? And I'm, you know, I can tell you what, I can tell you what you're getting. I can tell you what you're giving up for if you take this settlement, but I cannot tell you whether it's a good settlement or not. And I might be sitting back thinking this is a great settlement. You ought to grab it and growl, but I can't tell them that. The next relationship that we have, have to deal with on a regular basis is, is with the judge. Uh, and much like with the, the, the dealing with another lawyer, there are certain uh, limits that that we can go as far as our communications with them. Um, obviously, candor and truthfulness with the court is required. Um, you can't hide the ball from the court. You can't uh, obviously be <laughs> untruthful with the court. Um, and obviously, you have to have some respect for the court. Uh, one thing that comes up a lot of times that probably should never come up is what's called ex parte communications. And for those of you not familiar with what that is, that's having a conversation, a, a lawyer having a conversation with the judge about a matter without the opposition being there, whether the opposition is represented or not represented. It's, it's without the other side being there. That is prohibited. Uh, now, I say that's prohibited, and I'm, you know, it, it occurs it, with different judges in different jurisdictions. It occurs more than others. Um, it's not, I don't think it's necessarily something that, that is done uh, for a, an evil intent or to, to get around the rules. It's just 
There are some judges that find comfort in talking to you because they know you. Uh, they may feel, you know, they don't know the other lawyer. They don't know the other litigant. They may talk to you about certain matters. Um, I, I've had a judge who's no longer on the bench go so far as to call me and talk about another party's in the case motion. And, and it, was a, it was a summary judgment motion. And the judge called me and said, Mike, how should I rule on this? Uh, why should I rule for or against? And I said, Judge, that's not even, that's not even my client. Well, I know that's why I'm calling you, and, and you can't you can't do that. Um, but it does occur. But know that we can't have these conversations. Um, no matter how close you are with that judge, uh, no matter how you see that judge socially, uh, that's still an improper communication with that judge without the other lawyer being around. Um, Next slide. I'm going to take that. Well, one one of the things we were Mike and I were talking about earlier were um, within your. This, this is for the adjusters. You might have rules within your company as to what you're supposed to do when a new claim comes in. A lot of times, it might be back. Back when I was adjusting, they called it what the, the three point contact, I believe it was. Where you, and so you, you did that. You had, had to do these certain things in a certain time frame. And, you know, that's, that's what you had to do as your claim was going by. Well, one of them might be you got to get that statement from the claimant. Well, that's, that's your employer's rule. And that's what you get as an adjuster, you've got to do. But what do you do if the employee, I may have said employer a while ago, but employee won't give that statement if you can't get him on the phone or if he refuses to give that statement. Your, you know, your first blush might be to want to cut his benefits off. Be careful with those kind of things um, because although that's maybe a rule within your company, is it a rule within the act? Does the act say you can do that? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But always be careful when you're when you're getting ready to to stop somebody's benefits, especially medical, because uh, that that could come back to bite you. Uh, you've also got considerations, that, you know, aside from what your employer uh, asks you to do or demands that you do, but you've got you've got to be cons considered of the act itself and and related laws, like Jack just said. Uh, you also need to be cognizant that there are certain obligations that the employer uh, may have with you as the insurance company um, that may or may not be in line with what the act says or with what the law says. And obviously the law is going to control. So make sure that you're, you're not taking action or the employer is not taking action that's outside of the act. And obviously, and we'll address this a little bit more, in a minute, but your your big consideration, everybody's big consideration is don't get sued. Um, I, I know, you know, it's unfortunate that's part of the business, but it is, it's something that we we all concern ourselves with. Because um, if you've ever been involved uh, in a lawsuit uh, related to your employment or your actions, uh, you know how horrible that is. Uh, whether you did anything wrong or didn't do anything wrong, it's a horrible, horrible process to go through. It's very personal. Um, but again, we'll talk about that uh, later. And Jack, you, we were talking about this earlier. You were talking about as an adjuster. And by the way, we've both been in our prior lives, we've both been adjusters. So we, we, it's been a long time, but we kind of, we do understand what, what y'all go through on, on a daily basis. Uh, but you were talking about taking calls from the yeah. claimants. And back when I was adjusting, that was before the days of your own individual line. It was before the days of um, being able to see who was on the line before, you know, before you picked up a call. It all went through it through a switchboard. And um, where I was, we had a lovely lady running the switchboard and uh, she would buzz your desk. And if you didn't answer that, she would page you and then she would repage you. But by granny, you were going to take that call. And I had so I, my last year or so, I had this one person who really, I mean, I should have been on his Christmas card list. He called me every day and I had to take those calls and I was pretty much sick of that 
gentlemen. But but in the end, in the end, I'm very happy that I took all of those calls. And I'll tell you why. So I left adjusting work comp claims and went to law school. And um, as soon as I got out of law school, I, I became a work comp attorney. And the first case I had, the plaintiff on that case was my buddy, that man who had been calling me. And I sat there and there I was sitting across the table from him taking the deposition. And I said, got to ask him about how, you know, how his claim went and going through his timeline and all. And he, he said, um, and he said, and then I, when I was there, I had this guy, he was the adjuster. And I said, oh yeah, what was his name? And he said, looked at me, he said, well, Jack Rogers was his name. And I said, sure is nice to meet you. <laughs> And by that, I'm saying, I think you do have that ethical duty to take to take those calls. You don't have to listen to somebody, you know, talk ugly to you. You don't have to do that. But take their calls, listen to them, take their information down. If there's something you can do to help them, help them, or tell them what's going on. So many times, you know, that's uh, their their life is upside down right now. In so many cases, they they you know they're not making as much money as they were. They're hurt. They're hurting. You know, there's there's guys out there that are hurting really really bad, and they they want to talk to you. They want to know what's going on next, and they want to know you care. And that's a good opportunity to do that. And it's a good opportunity to to maybe make this case go a little bit smoother and end in a place where you can be happy with. Next slide. Along those lines, it, it, we talked about you know ethical guidelines that are actually covered by the act or, or governed by the act. Uh, and as Jack was just talking about communications with with the claimant, uh, and we talked about earlier about the what the lawyer's limitations are with the claimant. Similarly, y'all have some limitations with with talking to claimants. Uh, Obviously, if they're not represented and, and, and there's been no indication they've been represented, you can talk to them all day long. Uh, uh, you, know, you can answer all their calls. You can make call them. But you know, recognize that once they start talking about, I got a lawyer, um, you know, it, it, it's not that you're prohibited from talking to them because you may or may not be considered the actual client, but it's a good idea to stop at that point. Um, you know, I, I've got clients that it, that that is the moment that I get that file. As soon as that lawyer, or, or as soon as that claimant says, "I got a lawyer," um, I get the call. That says, "I'm I'm done. I'm not talking to him anymore." You talk to him, and that is a good good practice. Um, and I know there's some lawyers out there on the other side that y'all know uh, very very well, and and may feel comfortable talking to them. But I think it is a good practice um, at that point in time to stop that communication with that claimant uh, once they said they're represented. Um, you know, that, that, can, that can get you all, all kinds of trouble down the road if, if you don't cease that communication. Uh, but again, if they're not represented, you, you can have those conversations. Make sure those conversations, you know, as Jack said, are civil, uh, no matter how frustrated you get with that person. You know, you, 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 you need to treat them uh, as nice as you possibly can uh, that's going to come back to bite you. I see the eyes rolling over there. Uh, <laughs> it's hard. No, we all know it's hard, but it's, it's, it, it's got to be it, done. You know, there's so many times when we, we get into a case down the road and we start hearing stories about how they were treated on the front end. Um, well, so-and-so did this or so-and-so didn't do this. Uh, and that's what sends them down straight to the lawyer. Um, that's when they start reading the billboards. And listen to the commercials. Uh, the, the nicer y'all are to them, uh, the less likely they are to go find counsel and, and, and file a lawsuit. Uh, along, in, in addition to communications with the claimant, um, you've got communications with doctors. Um, that's an interesting twist in that you know, normally you can't talk to somebody's doctor about their medical condition. I mean, generally, we recognize that in, in, in the world outside of workers' comp, that's, that's a no-go. No, I can't call and ask about, you know, ask Jessica's doctor, what, did, what, did, what, did that, what happened that appointment last week? Um, tell me about that. Workers' comp's different. Um, the statute 
the statute starts off saying that you have certain rights as an employer or an insurer to talk to a doctor, to get reports. The statute actually is fun. The statute is very limited in, in what you can get. If you read the statute, it talks about you can get reports and you can get opinions. Um, that's then been taken further through case law to say that you can actually have conversations with these doctors. Uh, that being said, you know, I still think you need to be careful with the conversations you have with the doctors, limiting to what you actually need for the claim uh, with regard to the injury. I mean, obviously, sometimes you got to get into other things if there's pre-existing issues, uh, but you still need to recognize that there is a, a privacy issue there. Uh, and there is, you know, the, the, the claimant doesn't understand that you can do this. Uh, and you just don't want to get in, you don't want to cross that line into getting into somebody's personal business that you really have no business getting into. And from a practice standpoint, outside of the ethical portion of it, but uh, when you're talking to these doctors, realize that they've got a chart that they've got to fill out too. And so just be mindful of what you're saying when you're talking to the doctors, because it very well could end up in that note about that person. And I've, I've seen, I've seen notes before uh, that are very disparaging towards the adjuster or the insurance company, um, especially when there becomes an issue about certain treatment that's been recommended. And, and you know, even if you are totally justified in, delaying that treatment, you know, while you're investigating it, or you denied it because it's some you know, experimental treatment or for whatever reason, and you, you may be doing everything you're supposed to be doing, but that doctor puts in his note, I've seen this, I don't understand why the insurance company won't authorize the surgery. I've asked them four times to authorize the surgery. Well, that's in his notes. That goes, that goes to the opposing counsel. That goes to the judge. Uh, that doesn't, that doesn't look good at all. So just recognize, you know, what you're saying and what you're doing is potentially in those notes. And going back to talking about the conversations with the claimant, you know, understand too, that, you know, th th those, you know, those are things that you are documenting. And I'll, oftentimes they're documenting too. I mean, I've had claimants that, you know, show up at a deposition with their little diary or their notebook or their sticky notes. Um, and they've, they've kept a record pretty good of what, what you said as, as well as them. And, uh, you know, there, there are some judges uh, that are predisposed to think that y'all are not doing right or y'all are trying to screw the little guy. Um, and those kind of things don't help um, if, 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 there's a, if there's a question as to whether or not uh, they're right or you're right. Um, those sort of, those little sticky notes and those, comments uh, in a doctor's note don't, don't bode well at all towards the defense of a case. Uh, some other issues, uh, y'all have heard this, I'm sure a million times, you can't, you can't dictate care. You hear this from plaintiff's attorneys, you can't, you can't dictate care. Uh, on the other hand, you get to direct care, for lack of a better word. You know, one of the one of the upsides of workers' comp on the defense side, from y'all standpoint, is you get to choose the doctors. Um, that's a that's a huge deal. Um, you decide where they go to be treated. You know, if they don't like that physician, you get to decide what the other physicians are, who the other physicians are going to be that they get to choose from. That's a very powerful tool. Uh, but what will get thrown in your face is you can't dictate care, or you can't you can't decide what is or isn't going to happen. If the doctor says John needs a knee replacement, you don't get to say, no, he doesn't. Now, there are ways that you can challenge this. There's utilization review, and we can have a whole other seminar on utilization review. Uh, but there's that. There is the ability to go to a judge and say, judge, you tell me, uh, does John get the knee replacement? Uh, but you can't decide that he doesn't get the knee replacement. Uh, other thing that happens a lot of times is doctors refer to doctors. Right. That's what I was um, fixing to say. That referrals, remember, you get to decide or what doctors they're going to. You get to pick the doctors. So 
anticipate that. You know, if you've got a nurse case manager on your file, help with work with her to anticipate that there's a referral coming down the pike. When that referral is being ready, getting ready to be made, say, doctor, we would like for you to refer to Dr. X. Because, and here's why I say that to be, because you're gonna to have to sponsor that, you're gonna to have to sponsor a referral. So try to pick the doctor that, that you want it to go to, as opposed to him picking a doctor. And then you've got to fight the fight to get it away from that doctor that he picked. So if you've got a doctor in front of his face at the time he's wanting to make the referral, it's a lot easier on you that way. Because I can tell you, I, Mike's argued it, I've argued it both unsuccessfully to judges to try to say, we don't want Dr. X, we want Dr. Y. And the judge say, I don't care who you want, that's the authorized treating physician, that, and has, that's the referral he's made and that's gonna be the doctor you send them to. So if you, you kind of wanna be, I'm not saying to, to not authorize the referral, but try to give it a different path to go down so you get to maintain your control within the act. Along those lines, with, with you know other other considerations that we have on a, on a claim is the use of nurse case managers. Um, we know what nurse case managers are supposed to do and, and the purpose of them, and that is you know essentially to facilitate treatment and get these people well and get them back to work. The perception out there is, and I, I Googled this the other day, I, did, I just Googled nurse case managers, workers comp Alabama, and the number of plaintiff firm websites that popped up with paragraphs of disparaging comments about what nurse case managers do. I mean, that's all that popped up. And the perception out there is that nurse case managers are working for the insurance company purely to cut costs, to get people back to, 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 to work, but not in their best interest. Uh, and, and I understand that to a certain degree, but obviously that's not the purpose. And we all, I mean, I, there nobody in this room and nobody in this seminar that, that falls under that, but that is the perception that's out there. And that perception goes beyond lawyers. It goes to judges that have those, those ideas as well. I say that to, to make sure that, that, I's are dotted and T's are crossed in that relationship with the nurse case manager uh, and the adjuster and the doctor. And again, it goes back to notations. Uh, there, there are notes in the nurse case manager's files, there are notes in the adjuster's files, and there are notes in the doctor's files that need to accurately reflect what that relationship is and, and not go beyond that relationship. Um, There's a question that I was gonna address. Um, Somebody backing up a little bit said that they, uh, you know, if you could, as far as doctors making referrals, if you could ask that doctor, you know, did he have a specific reason that he wanted to use Dr. X as his referral? And if he didn't have an answer to that, then you could get him to refer to somebody else. I don't disagree with that, but the, the law is not 100% specific as to whether or not we can say we you're not going to refer to this doctor the best way to do it is to give him an opportunity to refer to the doctor that you want him to go to rather because the, the judges that we're going to have to go in front of they don't they tend to want to follow whatever the authorized treating physician is saying as their referral goes to yes ma'am No, ma'am. No, that's I, perfectly I, yeah. fine. If you and if if the doctor, I'm sorry, they're, they're, they're repeat the question. Yeah, I'm sorry. It, it, it's nurse coming from a nurse. She she says that uh, she has when a doctor has referred or attempted to refer to a specific doctor, she has asked, "Would you would you rather put in your note uh, I, uh, an orthopedic referral and then let the adjuster choose 
which doctor it is. Uh, and is, it, is that okay? And the answer, uh, yeah, I, I think that's good. that's fine. If if that doctor will go along with that, it's in, in fact, it's probably the best way to do it. And and I don't, I, you know, I, I think when a doctor makes a specific referral, I don't think, again, I don't think there's an evil intent in there. As you know, it just may be that's where he refers all his patients, workers comp or otherwise, and he doesn't. He, it, it, a lot of it's education. He may not realize, oh, this is why I, I shouldn't put this particular physician down because they have this choice down the road. A lot of them just don't even know that. Uh, right, and, and again, at, 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 following up on, on what was asked earlier, I think that's when nurse case managers create a great service when, when the, that issue is there and you all can handle that a whole lot better. And let's be honest, the doctors would much rather talk to y'all and have a lot more respect for y'all than they do lawyers or, or adjusters or non-medical people. Um, and that's, you know, they, they, don't, they don't want to talk to us or, or won't talk to us, to be honest with you. I mean, because they, they, see, they see talking to us as I'm going to get deposed. They're going to get deposed anyhow. But, they, they, but, <laughs> but that's, that's their fee. I'm not talking to a lawyer because that's, you know, I know where this is going. And there's a trust within the field with y'all, which I think is, you know, and I, and, you know, going back to what I was saying about what I, I see out there and hear out there about the perception, y'all, that, that's what I try to, to, to tell these people is, look, this is, this nurse case management benefits everybody in, in the whole game. I mean, because these doctors, they're not going to talk to not just us lawyers, they're not going to talk to the claimant's lawyer either. Um, and, and they certainly, you know, the, the, the communication with the claimant themselves may or may not exist. Um, so y'all, y'all benefit both sides. And I think that, you know, they, everybody needs to realize that. Um, also put on here, investigators just briefly um, recognize that, you know, the investigators have their own set of rules and, and regulations and ethics, but recognize that these, these people are hired by y'all. Um, and, and ultimately what they do wrong uh, or crossing the line is gonna come back to bite y'all too. So be careful uh, about who you hire um, and, 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 you know, what they do under your umbrella since, since they're working for y'all. Is there a question up there? <laughs> what? Is it a question or? It's, it's, it's a lot. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Is it an exam question? A little bit. I think it's along the lines of that same um, question that we have from here uh, with a general referral order. And a general referral order is fine. It's if that if that um, doctor is wanting to to uh, just to, just to get to an orthopedic, he doesn't. Have, and if you can get him to sign a, a just a general referral order, that's great. That puts the puts it all squarely in your control, and that's where you want to be when it comes to picking your doctor. So, yeah, a blank referral, general referral, those those are wonderful things. Well, to clarify the question, she was asking if they do a specific referral as an adjuster, are we allowed to ask for a general? So she was very specific on you know if it's already specific, then can we do general? Yeah, can you, you tell me, can the, can the adjuster go back to the doctor and say, will you change this to just the same thing that, that, that was asked earlier from the nurse? Yeah, I think that I don't have any problem with that. Um, you know, be careful the way you do that, because, again, the doctor, you know, doctors are funny. Um, <laughs> you know, don't challenge the doctor's authority. Don't challenge the doctor's knowledge. Um, you you got to tiptoe that because you don't want in his notes going, you know, Jessica demanded that I, you know, not send the patient to Dr. Jones. I mean, so you got to be careful. Yes. Is it, is it ethically appropriate? Yeah, I think it's fine. I said, but, but, but be, be careful on how you do it. And they um, will definitely put that in those notes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you cannot, don't, don't challenge, don't challenge them. Uh, to, she has to follow up. Sure. Do we have to ask the doctor to amend the note or is the order alone enough documentation? 
I would rather the note be amended as well. I mean, I think the more documentation, the better, so it's clear what was intended. You don't want you don't want a note saying one thing and a record saying the other, and then you get into debate down the road. So I think the the more the more documentation, the better. Uh, the other thing I put down here was settlement offers, and this has come up a, a couple times. Uh, when you make a settlement offer to a claimant, um, uh, most importantly, an unrepresented claimant, be careful when you state to the effect that the settlement offer is all they're going to get um, under the act. Uh, that's not necessarily true. Um, it's rarely true, actually. Uh, we all have our formulas. We know we know how it works. You get X number of weeks at this, and they've got this impairment rating, and especially on a scheduled injury, we, we figure it out, and it comes out to you know four thousand three hundred and twenty-three dollars and fifty-two cents. Um, don't send a letter out to the claimant uh, that says under the Workers' Compensation Act, this is all you're going to get. You look at me. I, I've seen it. It happens. Uh, it happens a lot. Because that's not all they're going to get if they go and litigate the case. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, we all know the judge does what the judge wants to do. Um, so don't put that out there. I mean, I think that is that is clearly crossing an ethical line when you when you say something like it, that because it's just flat out not true. At every settlement hearing, be it with an ombudsman or with a guy in a robe, he's going to say, "Is this what you want to do? You could get more. You could get less." So, uh, and you know, they, sometimes they're surprised because they thought, well, this was all I thought I could get. So they, you know, let them know on the front end that, that this possibly is not all they could get. Next slide. <clears throat> That's for Jack. You all don't know Jack. Jack has a fear of clowns. I was going to actually dress up as one, but I thought this... <laughs> This was enough. 20 years ago, he did dress up as a clown <laughs> in my office and ran me out. <laughs> uh, outrage. You know, the, the, the thing that keeps you up at night as an adjuster, uh, you know, it, it is the fear of all fears, and, and, and it's legitimate. I mentioned earlier, if you've ever been involved in a lawsuit or you've known anybody that's been involved in a lawsuit uh, with regard to their work, um, it's, it's absolutely horrible. And it doesn't matter if you did it or didn't do it it's still, it's terrible. Uh, matter of fact, I think it's worse if you didn't do it. Uh, but it's something you never want to go through. I'll let you explain what, what it actually is. Well, it, um, it, it, all right, we've all heard of the exclusivity provision of the workers' comp code. Well, there are some things that are not covered under that, and those are intentional torts. Fraud is an intentional tort. Most of these outrage cases come outside, you know, have some degree of fraud. So that's what, you know, all of these ethical things that we're talking about, if you're, if you're keeping in line with that, you're not going to commit fraud. You're, you're going you're gonna to handle this claim right. Now, with, you know, the, can they sue me? Yes. I tell my clients that all the time. Can it, when people, you know, come up to you as a lawyer, can I get, can they sue me for that? Yes. Are they going to win? Probably not. But you know, anybody that can go to the circuit clerk's office and sign a check can sue you. Uh, and so, that, but what we're trying to do, if you if you keep your ethical considerations in down like you're supposed to, then hopefully, when they're deposing you, think about anything that you're doing. How is that going to look as Exhibit 27? Do you want that? It, you know, so make make those thoughts. Keep those thoughts in your head um, when when some of these things come across that could, could go either way. There, there are really two two avenues to, to get to an outrage claim. And, 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 and let me comfort you with this. There are very few outrage claims that make it past the initial stages of litigation. Um, they, 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 there aren't a whole lot of them out there. Now, when they do, they're bad. Um, but you don't even want to, again, you don't even want to go there. You don't want to sit in an eight hour deposition, having everything you've ever done questioned. And, and that's what occurs in a case like that. But there are two things that will get you there. And one is, is, is an issue with denial of medical treatment or delay of medical treatment. And two is, is a settlement where, where it is perceived that you ramrodded a settlement, um, in order to avoid, 
uh, medical treatment or some old, uh, other type of payment. So those are two things to be careful with. You know, when you're denying or you're delaying medical treatment, make sure that it's justified. If there's a question about it, utilize the utilization review, utilize your lawyers, utilize your, your in-house nurses. Um, don't just off the cuff make a decision based on medical treatment. That's, that's I mean, you, you can imagine if you've got a claimant up there who did, was denied medical treatment uh, and, and somehow suffered, how that's perceived and is because of an insurance company. That, that's, the, that's the scenario that lays out and it, it, it's not good. Uh, settlements, again, you know, be careful about the timing of a settlement or the way you word a settlement. Um, you know, Jane is about to have uh, knee surgery and the knee surgery is gonna cost $20,000. Well, let me offer her $15,000 and see if she'll go put her surgery on her Blue Cross Blue Shield. We all do that, we know, we know, we know that, but it's how you do that. I mean, don't tell Jane that's what you, you know, hey Jane, you know, wink, wink. Um, be careful with that because that the twist of that is you Jane didn't get the knee surgery and Jane suffers now and Jane took a little money from you um, that you that you ramrodded. So those, those are the two ways you end up getting there. Um, also recognize who can be sued for outrage. Pretty much everybody's sitting in here. Um, I've got one now where adjusters being sued, companies being sued. Nurse case managers being sued, nurse case managers companies being sued. Um, and they like to call that a conspiracy. Yeah, yeah, everybody's in, I'm, I'm waiting for me to be added on there too, because w once the claim that's come out, they're gonna find out who really made the call. But, um, <laughs> but you know, nobody's immune. But again, I mean, and, and, and it's, a, it's a nothing suit. However, it's been going on forever and we're gonna have to go through depositions and it's gonna be a horrible, horrible experience for the people that are involved. Um, so there's your scary clown for the day. Next slide. Um, we on there? Is there any questions up there? Is, it, is that the same? That's the same one? All right, thank you. I think we touched on most of the obligations that we all have to an employer. Um, again, as we said earlier, make understand that they're the ultimate defendant in the case. Uh, from our standpoint, again, they're the ultimate client. Um, from y'all's standpoint, they're y'all's insured. Um, you know, you owe them, we all owe them a duty to keep them informed, let them know what's going on. Um, you know, some, some care, some don't. Um, I've got folks that they wanna know every single thing that's going on. I got others that don't bother me with workers' compensation. I got other things to do, that's why I pay a premium. Tell you when they do want to know what's going on when you settle the case and they want to know how much their premium's going up. Um, so it's a good idea to keep them informed along the line so that's not the first time they're hearing something. Uh, Especially in a case where we're looking at, you know, possibly somebody coming back to work with that may have some permanent restrictions. Be um, mindful that your employer would, you know, might have something for them to do within those restrictions. And so if you start telling them that from the front end, hey, this guy's probably not going to be able to do what he did do. Do you think you've got something else in there? That's, you know, that's something that from the start, as soon as you know it, let them know it. So they can start looking around within their facility to find what they might have for that person to do. And I've found that the, the employers that I represent that are involved are, the cases go much better um, the claims down the road go much better. They understand what's going on. Um, and so I think it's a good idea to keep them involved. I'm going to jump. Can you jump ahead to the slide that says text? All right. We got some questions. And we're going to do some prizes. And it, it, to make this fair to the people that are in here and online, here's how we're going to do it. You're going to text the number at the top. And that's my number, so you're gonna blow up my phone. Um, but I'm gonna ask six questions and you're gonna put your name in the text, the question number, and the letter that corresponds to the correct answer, with like the example shows below. This is the only time I'm giving these directions. I'm gonna give you a second. And the first six correct, all correct answers 
are going to get a prize. All right? First question. Which individual is most likely involved in an ethical issue? There goes my phone. Hey, let, let me go back. I, I said I wasn't going to give the directions. Let's send one text at the end with all the correct answers on it. So stop texting now. <laughs> We're going to send one text. It's going to say one through six. It's going to have your name on it, and it's going to have six answers next to it. I'm going to have to extend my plan. All right, number two. Who directed do the right thing? Which would be ethics. Right? Yeah. You younger people might have to Google that one. Number three. And people are still texting me each answer. <laughs> Once again, one text when we're done with all six answers. And please text him. It shouldn't go into the chat. Say so what? I asked them to text instead of putting in the, the chat. There we go. Number four, which is not a good source, not a good source for ethical guidance. Number five, which college football coach has not been the subject of an ethical investigation? Sorry, Bobby Bowden, that was kind of mean. He just died. Was... He's been absolved. Number six, in the first release, 2021 college football playoff rankings, what numbers are Alabama and Auburn? All right, that's the last question. Get your answers in. And I'd love to announce who won, but holy cow. <laughs> Just in case you weren't aware, there's 600 people watching. Yeah. I might have to shut this down. <laughs> okay, wait. Uh... That's as popular as he's been in a long, Jeez. long time. All right, here we go. When your phone carrier calls you. All right, we're going to stop, and I'm going to come back right before the next program, and I'll announce the winners at that point because it's going to take me a second. Thank you all so Thank much. Thank you all, Mike it. and Jack. Do we have our next two presenters mic'd up? We're good to go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're, we're about to do some more trivia questions for the folks on the Zoom call. And then we'll do a drawing for, for those of you who are here. Oh, got it. Okay, this is for the this is the next trivia question for the Zoom participants from the movie Elf. What was Elf's favorite breakfast food? From the movie Elf, what was Elf's favorite breakfast food? We're going to take the first correct answer. No, for the Zoom, Zoom participants.
Can you rest? I mean, you can't see anything else. Mm-hmm. I can't rest. Okay. Do I need to repeat the question? Okay. Do we have a winner? <clears throat> Our winner is Carol Beerwagon. And the correct answer was spaghetti topped with candy and syrup. Okay. The second trivia question for the Zoom participants from the movie Christmas Vacation. What set the Christmas tree to be on fire? That's that's kind of crazy. We're going to take the first correct answer for that one also. Is there a winner? Our winner is Tom Meyer. Tom Byer. Thank you. Meyer with an M. Okay. All right. Now we're going to do the drawing here live. We're going to do two. Just one. One twenty-five dollar 